True story. Dawn left her Christmas Eve service and headed straight to a 12-hour shift in the ER in Chicago. True, true story. The sound of ambulances and approaching helicopter told her what Christmas Eve night was going to be for her. Dawn, lock down room 15, yelled the charge nurse as she stepped into the nurse's station. Two security guards arrived, stand on either side of the door. Mask medics arrived with a man strapped and restrained. The hallway cleared as heads turned in disgust at the smell. As Dawn entered the room, she could see patient N with plastic bags wrapped around his legs and his feet. The yard doctor pulled off the bags and the smell overpowered the room as swollen, mold-encrusted legs and feet emerged. The doctor ordered lab tests, a shower, and a scrubbing, antibiotic scrubbing of the feet. Nurses and techs scattered in every direction, afraid they would be assigned. The charge nurse looked at Dawn. Would you please take patient in? You don't have to do a foot scrub. Just give him a sponge in the shower. Dawn watched her new patient mumbling incoherently through his dirty beard and ratty hair. The poor shell of a man had no one to love him. Nobody in the ER wanted to touch him. Nobody wanted to look at him. The smirking security guards walked him to the shower. And Dawn stepped in with shampoo and soap and towels. And she knew in her heart that for the next 10 minutes, this forgotten man needed to see the love of Jesus. She sat down, sat him down on a plastic chair, picked up the betadine, and scrubbed his moldy feet. When N was finished in the shower, Dawn wrapped him in a warm blanket, put two basins on the floor, and knelt in front of the rotting, oozing legs. With tears streaming down her face, her gloved hands sponged soap over the wounded feet. The once mocking security guards handed her towels. As she patted the last foot dry, for the first time, patient N's eyes locked onto hers. For that moment, he was alert and aware and crying. And he quietly mouthed, thank you. In that moment, he was seeing Jesus. For Dawn, something about that baby in the manger story that she'd heard a few hours earlier translated into that hospital room that night. But what? Why? Why? We've brushed up against enough of ancient biblical history in our sermons this last year for many of you to understand that before Jesus arrived on this earth, most people didn't show empathy for some unknown person. The world was largely, a word we would probably use to describe it is barbarian. We, we might imagine in our compassionate 21st century minds that nurses back in the Roman Empire would gather up the homeless and care for them in the way that Dawn cared for this man, nursing them back to health. But the actual historical truth is, there were no nurses. There were no hospital care. Unless you were one of the Roman elite, unless you were one of the Roman army, or unless you happened to have enough money to pay for a doctor's care. Many people in Jesus' time, and every century before that, just died. The average lifespan in Jesus' day was 35 years of age brought down sharply by the fact that so many people, so many kiddos, never did make it past childhood. But it was the Christian church, history says, that started building hospitals for the common people. It was the compassionate Jesus followers who began to give their lives in sacrificial service to other people. Nobody else seemed to have cared. Nobody else seemed to have done so for centuries up to that time. So what actually happened that evening in Chicago? 
What happened in that emergency room in the 21st century between dawn and patient N was the direct outcome of the arrival of Jesus onto this planet. So what was it about the arrival of a baby in a manger 2,000 years earlier? What had transformed Dawn's soul? And what has transformed the hearts of millions of other people since? What was it? Many, many people will right now, this week, perhaps today, be reminded of a virgin teenage girl, how she gave birth to a baby. We just were reminded right here in this room. Because of a room shortage, she had the baby in a stable. She ended up laying him in a feed trough. And many will be reminded how massive angels came and they sang good news, great joy to a bunch of shepherds. And those shepherds ran to find out where the baby was laying. And many will hear that story this week, and think how strange and unbelievable it all sounds. Many will dump the Jesus story that they hear into their fable file, along with Spider-Man and Harry Potter. Even more concerning to me, some people will go to church today. Some are sitting in church right now on this Sunday before Christmas. And they will be reminded of singing angels and a star and the arrival of a baby into this world. And then they will leave the church with absolutely no idea how that baby Savior transformed the world. And how that baby Savior could transform their lives too. All of us, we're going to walk out those doors. People on the screen are going to turn it off. In a little while, all of us will then be crammed into the modern fray that we tend to call now the Christmas season. The quietness of Bethlehem exchange for the din of shopping malls, eight-lane interstates. The poverty of Jesus' gift getting all mixed up with the need for lavish spending. The Lone Star of Bethlehem, now memorialized by billions of lights all over the world, and yet somehow very few people quite make the connection anymore. The deeply significant gifts of the Persian Magi, who traveled a thousand miles to bring them to the Christ child, has given way to plastic toys that travel thousands of miles in cargo ships. And instead of uncountable numbers of singing angels, we tend to focus on flying reindeer. Look at the picture on the back wall. It's a little hard to make <laughs> somebody's house. Imagine a kid walking along looking at that mess. I blew it up so I could see what was in it. If you watch close, you can actually see Mary and Joseph right back here behind the candy cane, right in front of the blow-up Santa. And I blew it up to enough to see that baby Jesus was actually out of his manger standing up. <laughs> but he's heavily eclipsed by the huge blow-up Sanya just off of his port bow. I'm not trying to destroy your festive Chris- Christmas spirit, but it is absolutely essential that I point you in the next few minutes to what this season is really all about. What it was planned by your creator, what it was handcrafted by the God of heaven to be, what about it could transform a life. Obviously, very little on that display would do so. And it's so easy to get caught up in diversions. We will, some of us will do it in the next few hours, get caught up in diversions. Let me show you, let me illustrate a real diversion here. This actually comes from a pastor of a church in Upland, California. It's still there. I looked it up. Probably not meeting today because it's in Upland, California. But this is what the pastor writes. There are few causes to which I'm more passionately committed than that of Santa Claus. Santa, Cla- I heard my grandchildren discussing last night whether or not he actually exists. I'm just saying. This is a pastor. Santa Claus deserves not just any place in the church, but the highest place of honor. 
where he should be enthroned as the long-bearded ancient of days, the divine and holy one whom we call God. Santa Claus is God the Son. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. Simply refers to God the Son slipping into the secrets of the heart as easily as he slips down the chimney of a house. Santa Claus is God the Father, the creator of heaven and earth, in whose hands are a pack of bursting at its seams with gifts of his creation. Santa Claus is God the Holy Spirit who comes with a sound of gentle laughter with a shape like a bowl full of jelly to sow in the night the seeds of good humor. I've seen him in the toy store, I've seen him in the car on the freeway, and when I see him with his crazy beard and his baggy red suit, I see more than the seasonal merchant of cheap plastic toys. I see no less than the triune God. Oddly, I don't see that at all. I see a seasonal merchant of cheap plastic toys. But if you came here today and you leave with images of a fat man sowing seeds of good humor in the night, that cannot possibly answer the deepest crying needs of your soul. What in the world can address the hole that you sensed deep inside of your soul? What can address the sinful addictions that have hung on for years and they just never seem to go away? How in the world can you walk out of a Christmas service into a brand new year and have your sinful guilt washed away, have your soul cleansed, have your mind finally at peace? How can that happen? My task for the next few minutes here in this room is to move us away from a hodgepodge of mixed up facts. We absolutely have to move beyond. Absolutely have to move beyond even the mental image of a ceramic, and I'm pointing ceramic Mary and Joseph with a couple of cows and sheep standing at attention. I know some of you are making fun of that ceramic one in the hall. It gets made fun of absolutely every year. But in reality, something happened that night. Something actually happened that turned the entire world upside down. Something happened that eventually turned pagan barbarians all across this world into God-loving, some of them God-loving, humanity-serving, Jesus followers. What was it that actually happened? And whatever it was, it has zero connection to you better watch out, you better not cry, you better not pout. I'm telling you why. Here it is, Luke 1, 5. Joseph took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. I left my notes in. She's still a virgin, just like Isaiah predicted 700 years earlier. While they were still there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth, laid him in a manger, because there was no room in the inn. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared unto them, and radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, yes, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. So what really just happened there? To you that have heard that story over and over in your life, there is this warm spot in your soul when I read those familiar words to you. But to the Buddhist kid who's hearing the story for the first time, In Cambodia, those words sound like a fairy tale. A virgin has a baby. Angels appear and pronounce the baby to be the savior of the world. One of the things that separates Christianity from most, in fact, all other religions in the world, is that people in other religions are constantly taught they don't need a savior. Remember the last words of that video? Our sins cannot actually be forgiven. They're simply going to be corrected by a series of things that we personally do to improve ourselves. People who don't think they need saving 
don't care anything about a Savior. Most of us, though, look at the history of the development of the people around us. And as somebody who does a whole lot of researching in my life, I read constantly of people who talk about the ancient Egyptians and the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Romans, and they talk about how they were great empires of admirable people. And the actual truth of the matter is the daily actions of people in the Babylonian Empire that we've been looking at lately with the stories from there, or the Roman, the daily actions of people in the Roman Empire would put you in federal prison here today. And yet they did them day after day. That was their life. They desperately needed a savior. They just didn't know it. And even now, when we look at people who are living on this planet now, there are people today. There are people this Christmas week who are huddled around in a circle trying to figure out how they can blow up other people. A teenage girl yesterday blew herself up in Nigeria and killed a bunch of other people. There are people right now sitting in circles this week on Christmas week trying to figure out how they can ethnically cleanse people in their country they don't want there. We'll get them out of here. They don't deserve to live. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I, I was watching TV Friday night. And it was a cop program. And it was exposing the, the, the wretched, perverted, seedy side of a city. It was, it was Chicago. Same place Don still lives. And it was, it was bad. And they were cleaning it up. But, but at the exact same moment that they were talking about cleaning up the perversion. Totally ungodly, anti-biblical themes were written into the lives of the good guys. And it was presented as if it were perfectly normal. And I laid down that night, and it just washed over me how God must look at this world. Where his truths are largely ignored most of the time. And then we look at our own lives. We look at the things that we find so hard to do right. And if we're honest about God's revealed expectations, we don't tend to see a planet full of people, including ourselves, who just need to do a few things to make themselves a little better. The reality is humanity is sinful to the core. All of us are. We know that. And there is no way any of us can claw our way to redemption. When other religions say that somehow or another we can earn our way to righteousness, we can earn our way to redemption, something inside most of us is saying that's not true, that's false, that's foolishness. Sinful humanity doesn't will itself to become better. We don't just think our way to becoming better. We know that. We've tried most of us are still working on or already have in place our 2021 resolutions. And many of them are the same resolutions we had on the list last year. The only thing that will ever move this world toward righteous living is if our loving creator can, could, will transform the lives of those who accept his invitation. Suppose a sinless God did come to this earth. Suppose that sinless God took on himself the earned punishment of sinful humanity. Suppose that's true. And suppose that God defeated sin, Satan, and hell by breaking the very chains of death itself and rising victorious over death. Suppose that's true. Suppose the baby in the manger was that God. If and only if that happened, would there be something concrete that could free us from the guilt, the penalty, the actual daily dragging out of our sins? Because we sure aren't going to free ourselves with such a personal intervention from God himself. If that's not true, we are still 
lost in our sins. We have no hope of fixing the unfixables. We have no hope of receiving forgiveness. We have no hope of inheriting eternal life. But the only reason the Christmas story fixes that, the only reason it makes any sense to you to fix that, you that are sitting in this room, and think about it from the standpoint of the Cambodian boy. Think about him. Reading it for the first time, a virgin-born baby, a heavenly army of angels singing, a brilliant star overhead, wise men traveling a thousand miles to bring gifts, Herod killing the firstborn, trying to wipe out this new king. All of that sounds like fable material to the unbeliever. And the only reason you accept the story of a virgin baby, virgin-born baby, is because you believe the God who prophesied 700 years before that that was on its way. The God, the God who you believe prophesied through Isaiah the prophet. Here we are, let's put them up here. Isaiah 7, 14, the Lord himself, 700 years before Jesus would be born, the Lord himself will give you a sign, a virgin will be with child, a virgin will bear a son, that Child who is born to the virgin will be called Emmanuel. That's 714. And here's 96, the two most famous in the Old Testament. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Baby, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And many of you buy into that truth. Because you know enough to put the pieces together in your head. Israel's greatest prophet hit the bullseye 700 years before, hit the bullseye exactly that one day a Jewish teenage virgin would give birth to a child, and she did. And that that child would not just be another Jewish kid. He was going to be Emmanuel. He was going to be God with us. The baby was going to be mighty God. The baby was going to be the everlasting father, briefly wrapped in swaddling clothes. Some of you know the math, that Isaiah was not the only one who made prophecies about this coming Messiah. In fact, there are 48 of them, major prophecies of the coming Messiah. And as many as 400 other minor prophecies, written hundreds of years apart, that Jesus' arrival, life, and death fulfilled to the letter. And if you're interested in statistics, the chance of one person being born ever on the planet who would fulfill just eight of those prophecies, let's just take eight, the chance of anybody ever being born that would fill eight of the major prophecies, the time of his birth, born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, etc. The chances that one baby would ever be born that would fill just eight of those is one in 10 to the 17th power, 18 zeros. That doesn't mean anything to you, but that's the same. Josh McDowell used to say that's the same chances as if you covered the entire state of Texas two feet deep in silver dollars. And then you blindfolded somebody and sent them out into the state of Texas. The chances of them picking up a single silver dollar, marked silver dollar, in the whole state of Texas of silver dollars two feet thick is the same chances that one person would be born and fulfill just eight of the 48 prophecies. The chances that one person would be born that would fulfill all of the prophecies that were written over hundreds of years, 16 of them. The chances one person would be born that would fulfill 16 of them would be like silver dollars from the center of the sun in a ball to the outside orbit of Neptune. And the idea that one person would go into there and pick out one marked silver dollar is the same chances one person would fulfill 16 of the 48 major prophecies. And yet Jesus fulfilled every single one. And the God who gave us the prophecies told us exactly why he would be arriving. The little baby born to a virgin girl lying in a manger was going to be God himself. 
God would come to this earth. God would release humanity from the bondage of their sins. And that one, the one out of whom came all matter and energy in the universe, that one would become a human embryo. The infinitely powerful, almighty God would allow himself to become pierceable so that he could be killed by the very people he came to save, so that he could pay the sin price for all of humanity. The creator of life, holiness housed in a virgin's womb, here to defeat sin's stranglehold once and for all. We've been saying, I've said a couple of times so far, many look at that holy story and they just find it hard to believe. I gave you quotes here on Wednesday night of people who are Christian, who fit inside of the framework of calling themselves Christian, who look at that story and say, it's a nice story about a baby, but it's not true that the baby was God. Can't possibly be that God would take on a human body. But if we truly understand the unsolvable problem of humanity's sinfulness, If we really get it, how lost we are without God, how badly we need it. If we get it, there are no sacrifices. There are no pilgrimages. There's no incense burning. There's no self-mutilation. There's no building deifications to animals or stars or building something out of stone or wood. There's absolutely none of that that's going to save us from our many sins. None of that will do so. If we truly understand the unsolvable problem of human sinfulness, and if you believe in a divine deity, a supreme deity that's bigger than yourself, the only logical solution is not that God would force you to atone for your own sinfulness. That never works, never has, will not in the future. The only logical conclusion is that God in his great love would do it for you. Hebrews 2.14, becoming one of my favorites. 14 and 15, because God's children are human beings, that's us, made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death over us. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. It's so important that we understand what happened when Jesus got out of the manger. So critical for us on Christmas Sunday. It's so important for us to understand that in spite of the fact that the picture we looked at a little while ago, you couldn't see it, but I actually blew it. I have Jesus standing up beside his manger on the first day. He didn't do that, but he did later. And in the next three decades, he began to tell people who were willing to hear exactly who he was and why he was here. And then he submitted to the very people that he came to save, who murdered him, murdered him. Only then were the people who were perceptive enough to understand what was going on, were they able to discover that that was exactly what needed to happen for him to pay the sin penalty for our sins. He had to die. He was born to die. He came here to pay my sin penalty and yours. I discovered something this week that you may not want to hear. I wanted to know how many verses in the Bible actually tell us the story of Jesus' birth. So I looked it up, counted Read my whole Bible. No, I actually didn't do that. You can check me on this. Don't do it now. Wait till after. Here's what I found. There are two verses in the Old Testament. We already looked at them that specifically tell us God would come as a baby. That's two. When we get to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, first chapter in the New Testament, there are seven verses that tell us the story of of Jesus' arrival. Seven. That's nine total. When you get to Luke 1 and 2, that's the big one. 
two passages, two chapters, 63 verses. Almost everything we know about the birth of Jesus comes from those two chapters. That's 71 verses. The whole rest of the Bible, everything else, if I stretch it, making verses that maybe shouldn't be in their fit because they're part of the, if I stretch it, 14 more verses in the entire rest of the Bible. That's 86. 86 verses out of 31,102 that directly or even indirectly mention the birth of Jesus. Why in the world, Chess, are you going to so much trouble? On Christmas Sunday morning, when we're all geared up to hear about the baby in the manger, we're all geared up to hear about the star and the angels. When the singers have already worked so hard to make a musical image of our Savior, why would you mar it all up by telling us that the story of Jesus' birth only fills 0.00276% of the pages of the Bible? Because I so want you to see that the rest of the New Testament is devoted to telling us why the baby came, why he arrived, what that's supposed to do inside of you. The whole rest of the Gospels, the, the entire set of epistles and the book of Revelation, in all of that, there's no more mention of singing angels until you get to Revelation. And in Revelation, the singing angels aren't singing about his first coming. They're tuning up for his second coming. There's no more mention of shepherds, no more mention of wise men, no more focus on a manger or a star or Herod slaughtering all of the firstborn. The rest of the Gospels, all of the epistles, the final book of Revelation focuses on what this arriving Savior came to achieve in our soul. Why did he come? What was his purpose? What does that do inside of you today? Without the God in human flesh part, the birth of a baby Savior means little. Some believe. Some are wrong. He came so we would be nice to one another is not a message that can ultimately give my life meaning. Assure me of God's love beyond my brokenness and break open the dark doors of death in my soul with the keys of hope. There's more, and it's critical. Watch these two passages that we'll close with. The most concise, potent statements in the Bible about the incarnation of of Jesus onto this earth. It's all from John, Jesus' disciple and his cousin. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard, whom we have seen, we saw him with our own eyes, we touched him with our own hands. That Jesus, that word, is the word of life. This one who is life himself was revealed to us and we have seen him. We now testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father and then he was revealed to us. And in his gospel, the same writer starts out in John chapter 1. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God. The word was God. And then the cap off of all cap offs in 14, the word became human and made his home among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word became flesh. The infinite became finite. The eternal one entered time. Why does John call him the word? Does that ever bother you? Why didn't he write, in the beginning was Jesus? In the beginning was Jesus the Savior. In the beginning was Jesus the Messiah. Wouldn't it have been a lot easier if he would have cleared that up so we understood exactly what he was talking about? The answer is, John didn't write this specifically to you. You weren't going to be born for 2,000 more years. He doesn't give any explanation for why he used the word word because he didn't need one. 
Everybody who was going to read it knew just exactly what he was saying. Everybody, including the pagans who read it, that Greek word logos, in the beginning was the logos. For everybody who spoke Greek, for every pagan person who lived in the time of John and Jesus, every single one of them thought it meant exactly the same thing. They thought it meant the creative force, the intelligent mind of the universe. They didn't believe in a God. They didn't believe in the Jewish God. They certainly didn't accept the God of the Jews. They believed in many gods. But the one word they all believed together, the one word they were all sure was true, was that the Logos was the creative, intelligent force of the universe. And what John is saying to them, right there, the, the pagans, what he's saying to the pagans in John 1.1 1, 1 is that the creative, intelligent force of the universe is not a force, it's a person. And that person cared so much for his creation that he came here to save us. The Logos became flesh. Let me hang there for a minute. In modern times, the theory of evolution, which is still being taught to minds full of mush as scientific fact, has taken quite a hit in the last few years. More and more scientists, agnostic scientists, atheistic scientists, more and more of them are saying that what they see in the intricate design of the universe, particularly when they began to decode the DNA, in a cell and found out that inside of the DNA there was a language written. Many scientists are now proclaiming that all of it is the result of intelligent design. They don't say God. They don't even believe in the God of the Bible. Einstein was one of the first ones who went down this path. And yet they say the design is too intelligent to be the product of time and chance. But if they admit that it may be the God of the Bible, then they're going to have to deal with what the God of the Bible said about our sin and our salvation. And John is facing the exact issue. That's exactly what he's arguing 2,000 years earlier. To the pagan people, the designer of the universe came as a human being. And he came here with a very clear mission in mind. He came as a savior to save us from our sins. And the Jews, they knew exactly what the word meant. Nobody questioned it. They'd been told for centuries. The word of the Lord came and said this, and the word of the Lord came and said that. They knew that the word was simply God revealing himself to them. And when John said that first sentence in 14 they knew everybody knew exactly what he was trying to say the word became human the word the intelligent designer the one who made it all the creator of the universe came here and became one of us and he made his home here and we saw his glory the glory of the only begotten from the Father, the supreme, the original, the begotten one, not the born one, the begotten, the original, the supreme from the Father. And he was full of grace and truth. This human wasn't like other humans. This human was filled with God's glory and this human was filled with God's grace and this human was filled with God's truth. The unchanging, follow me, the immutable, word we don't use much, the immutable God who never became anything. He, ever, he never does. It's the word ginomai. He, he, he doesn't grow. He doesn't change. He doesn't get more intelligent. God doesn't get more powerful. He already is. He doesn't become anything. But one day he became something that he never was before. He became human. Took on our form. Came here for us. And he became human on purpose. There was a reason. That's why it's so important for every single person sitting in a church today to understand exactly why he came. They won't. Some won't. You will. I pray. In the beginning, John 1, 1, the word already existed. The word, the baby savior, 
who existed before it all. The baby Savior was with God, and the Savior of the world was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him. Nothing was created except that that was created through him. He made the universe. Before Jesus, the baby, ever got here, he created everything that is every molecule of matter and energy. And then watch verse 4. The word gave life, life to everything he created. And John doesn't, I left my notes in here, John doesn't use the word bios, from which we get the word biology. He he uses the word zoe. He purposely uses the word zoe. That's not just the beating of your heart. That's not just the pumping of your blood. The soul deep abundant life that throbs in our body as a result of the gift of God. Almighty God, God, John says the baby in the manger didn't just open his eyes and let out a squall showing that he arrived. The creator baby was the very one who provided, not just the blood pumping ability so we won't be declared dead, but John says the source of life, the source of vital, vigorous zoe, the motivating reality that animates us and drives us to achieve and drives us to build and drives us to create and drives us to show love and drives us to show compassion. That zoe he put in us because the creator of the universe came here to make sure that that life was built inside of you. And he doesn't stop there. The word gave life to everything that was created, and this life brought light to everyone. And the light he brought shines in the darkness, and the darkness can't extinguish it. When he arrived, he turned the light on. There was none. Remember, the world was really barbarian if you study your history. He's the one who said, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. The light, verse 5, shines in the darkness. Remember the light that showed up throughout the Bible of God, Shekinah glory? But it came on and it went off. But when he got here, it came on and it stayed on. And even when he went back to heaven, he left the spirit of Christ in us that shines on. And the darkness cannot overcome it. It can't extinguish it. He began He began to roll back the darkness when he arrived, and that's why we begin to see the whole world changing after his arrival, because the darkness started to be pushed back. And he pushed back the darkness in people's soul. I come into this room during the week. None of these lights are on. There's one little light usually shining, that one there. This room's dark, man. We built it that way on purpose. There's no light. That little light right there kind of radiates to the room, and you can see the shadow of every chair. And then I go back there to that soundboard that I'm not supposed to touch. (laughs) And just bump the master button. Just bump it. And just a bump of the master button, and everything you see, except the windows, everything you see just pops. And as it pops, everything in the room begins to show up. That's what Jesus did. But he took his hand on the master control and he jammed it. And the darkness can never put it back out. Not everybody embraced. Not everybody does now. He says so. Same passage. He came into the very world he created. The world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, even they rejected him. But all who believed and accepted, he gives the right to become God's children. That's you. Children of God. That's why he came. He's specifically talking about you. God came here looking for me. He came here looking for you. And he's holding out his loving arms of grace to you. He's doing it today. He's doing it right now. He's inviting you to come. Man, what he went through on our behalf. How far he went to reach you, to bring to you life, and then to turn on the light. 
so you're never, ever, ever the same anymore. Oh, God, you know us in this room well. And some of us, probably all of us, stumble at times. In fact, we all do. But there may be some in this room that just have never, ever found the life, the light at all. That Zoe life that we all, we're all living or we wouldn't have walked into this room, that bios. But, but the, 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 the coming alive on the inside. Some people here have never experienced that. And then the fact of the darkness being pushed back until the light extinguishes the darkness rather than the darkness extinguishing the light. Oh God, I'm asking for the people in this room, the people who are watching this from afar, that right now there would be a drawing to you. Some of you here need to make this Christmas Sunday morning a definitive moment in your life. It's not hard. He made sure of that. He did all that needs done so that you can be saved. That's why he's the Savior. He came to wash our sins. He came to turn on the light. And he wants to do that for you right now. You need to pray. If you're in this room, if you're watching on the stream, put everything else out of your mind for two minutes. Most important two minutes of your entire life. And pray these words to God. Oh God, I think I get it. I think I understand that you really love me. I understand you went to such lengths to bring me salvation to forgive my sins. God became human so you could pay my sin penalty. Oh, I accept that today. I embrace that as my gift from you. Oh, how I say thank you today. I'm, I'm opening my heart to you right now. I'm opening my soul up. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you free reign, the, the, the Savior of my life, the Lord of my life. I'm asking you, God, to direct my life. Because from this moment on, I am embracing you as my Savior and as my Lord. Right now, today, in this room, Christmas Sunday, 2020, I run into your arms. I run into your arms right here, right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Let's lift our voices. Oh, come all ye faithful.
it's not a word we use a lot either. I adore you. We love you. We love you back. Not because we loved you first. Because you first loved us and gave your son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. The baby became a man and took my sin punishment on himself. For that, God, we say thank you. We run right into your loving arms. And I pray for everyone who's watching this right now that during the next five days that we would see you as a God with arms outstretched. God in the flesh, arms outstretched, waiting for us to run right into them. We pray this in Jesus' name.